you know, you have to have systems in place, right? I, I don't know if I, I mentioned it, but, you know, when I looked at what I did in, in, in skyscrapers, what had like, you know, 500 moving parts and I'm like, okay, I could build this thing, but what's real estate about? And real estate's really finding, funding and facilitating the process, right? If you were just to simplify it, one, two, three. And, you know, these are the systems that you have to put in place because if you don't have systems, you know, you're essentially, you know, putting yourself in a category, I would say 90% of people without systems have a good probability of failing. What's up, everybody? It's Jamel Gibbs, your family-oriented entrepreneur. And on this channel, we teach real estate investors and entrepreneurs how to create time and freedom through proven real estate investing strategies. Welcome to the Business and Investing Podcast where you learn all things business and investing related. So today we're going to talk about a topic that I know you guys are particularly interested in uh, because a lot of you guys are brand new. Uh, I do pay attention to what's happening on the, uh, the YouTube channel and on the podcast and things like that. Now, I just want to let you guys know this podcast is spread throughout the entire world. I really appreciate the support that we're getting on this podcast. So let's keep pumping out these uh, podcast episodes so that you guys can continue to learn. But going back to what I wanted to say, I know a lot of you guys are brand new and you want to just figure out how to get started or how to set up your business the right way in order to be effective in your real estate investing business. So that's exactly what we're going to talk about today with my man, Ken Van Lu. What's up, man? How are you, brother? It's great to see you. Oh man, it's a pleasure, bro. So we were together, I want to say uh, three, four months ago, was it? Yep. yep. About three um, months ago in Tampa. Tampa. Yes, sir. And I wanted to, I actually had you on a previous video, uh, but I wanted to get you back on the line uh, on this particular podcast because number one, you're a gold mine of uh, information. Uh, we were just talking right before the call and you're, you have 45 acres that you're about to develop here in North Carolina, all the way from New Jersey. New, no, let me yeah. change that, man. New Jersey. Jersey. <laughs> and, 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 you, and you know, I, I sat in a table in Brooklyn every Sunday too. My mom's from your home turf. So yeah, man, you were, Court you, you built up yeah, exactly court street. So I grew up right in Red Hook, you know, that, which is, you know, I used to spend a lot of time on court street. I used to work at, uh, uh, bagels by the park yeah, <laughs> in Carroll gardens. Absolutely. My, I had a little job. Scotto, Scott O funeral homes. My cousins. <laughs> wow, man. Scott, wow, first man. place. I'm first place. Yeah. My, my mom went to St. Mary's church right there. And, right there on uh, court street, man. Yeah, Right there on court street. Yeah. Small and guess what? World. I used to play for St. Mary's basketball team when I was a kid. <laughs> I'm telling my mom that tonight, man. Yeah, that, man. That's, that's a small world. Yeah. My, my grandfather owned the, the literally the property right on the corner across from St. Mary's a little fish market there. Yep. And then there was the, you know, I think the boys had a little card game down going in the down floor and my, my mom and dad, you know, my father lived up, mom lived upstairs with grandpa and grandma right there. Yep. Yep. So we had visitation, which was in the back of Red Hook. And then we had St. Mary's and I played for both teams. They, uh, they, there was a guy named Paul Jafoni who used to have a funeral home on uh, Van Brunt street and, yeah. and Red Hook. I, I think he still has it. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure, but he ran the the CYO basketball league, and we used to play for that team, man. So small world, man. Yeah, small yeah. world. Now listen, man, we're gonna cover a lot. So you've done everything from <clears throat> uh, building up skyscrapers to commercial real estate to residential and everything in between. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, bro? Sure. You know, I. Uh... You know, I got started a while ago. So, you know, I, I get to bring back a little wisdom. And, you know, the beauty of it is when I first got started, you know, I wasn't quite sure what I was doing. So I learned the hard way mm -hmm. and, you know, it built character. So that was the good news. And, and the one thing I always say is, you know, I learned kind of in reverse. So I, I, I preach from, you know, it's okay to learn from the top down and be a little confused because you have bigger breakthroughs and, you know, you get to learn a little bit more, right? So even though you're getting started, if you have that mindset of big time thinking with a, with a long-term vision, it will all come true, you know, and that's how I started. But um, I started, uh, you know, I really bringing some of my sports at my sports attributes to the table because I wasn't a great student, you know, and I, 
I thank God I met my wife when I was taking calculus two for the third time. She taught me how to study. And then three years later, I, I received an engineering degree. And in engineering, civil engineering, that senior year, I won this design award. It was a 13-acre site that I literally civil engineered. And it kind of planted this seed. But I didn't know anything about real estate. And, you know, dad just telling, you know, get your degree, go work, be a civil engineer, you'll have a good career. And I went in and I started civil engineering. I couldn't sit at the desk. I mean, literally like one year, I was like, I, you know, I got to get out in the field. I had some construction jobs during my summer interns. I worked for the Port Authority. Next thing you know, about a year out of school, I was building this 32 unit building in Poughkeepsie, New York. And by the time I ended up getting the four years of experience for to take my professional engineer's exam, I was already making more money in construction. You know, I, so I really never went back to engineering other than right. I got the license to open up the door. So I kind of started in engineering, not knowing you know, what I was doing. I was a superintendent in New York City building skyscrapers. And one day I was standing there literally looking out at the World Trade Center. It was 1992, I guess it was. You know, and I started to think, like, I, I got to make something happen. I just had my twins. And, you know, it took about seven years before I built up $100,000 debt. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I now definitely got to do something. And I jumped in to real estate back to that top-down thinking approach with like, how can I break out into real estate and pay myself? So I had this thing in my head, you know, I figured out nine ways to earn fees in real estate development. And my first deal was a $17 million project where I said, I'll pay myself a 5% development fee, 3% construction management fee, and 8% general conditions. That'll be a great payday, even if I don't get any ownership. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and uh, I, I went out and did it. My first project was a $17 million assisted living. We did that. So, and then we worked in reverse. And before I wrote the book, um, we did 137 residential deals in one year. And we were teaching people how to get their business started, how to take advantage of taxation. I came out with this, my taxation filtration system, you know, where I could show you how to put $100,000 through and only pay taxes on 30 grand. And that's what people want to know when they're getting started, you know, just as long as they're not going to go to jail, which I made my, my accountant like, just show me where the fine line is, brother. Yep. Because you know, <laughs> uh, we're, we're starting on a shoestring here, you know, and that's what, that's what they did. You know, my advisors kept me out of trouble, had a good lawyer, had a good accountant and, uh, and just started from there. You know, it was a mouthful so, so there for you, brother. <laughs> no, that's good stuff, man. So was it an easy transition for you? Like, so, so you had, you were working for a company, obviously, right? And then you ended up becoming an investor, man. So how, what was that transition like? Great, 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 great uh, question. So, you know, I went from, you know, working for a construction management company. They were, you know, Bovis, you know, Lear McGovern Bovis. They restored the Statue of Liberty. Um, we did, you know, Metro Tech, which was a billion dollar project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I went from there. Um, to work for some developers. So I worked for Davis and Eichner and did 80th and 3rd, 64th Street. And then I guess it was about, um, it's probably 1996. I did a short stint with a company. It was actually a, a women's business owned enterprise that I brought to 40 million from five. And I was like, okay, I got to do this myself. So it was probably, mm. uh, you know, 99 when I, when I broke out and, um, you know, I, I may have lost track of the timeline there, but when I broke out in, in you know, in that, I, I really felt confident that if I could build big buildings and do little buildings, now was time to kind of go out of my own business. So in 97, I think I formed a company. It wasn't until 99 until I opened the door. So it was probably 96. It was probably a three-year transition to get the courage up and, you know, a lot of sleepless nights figuring out, you know, what's going to happen when that paycheck ends. And what I actually did um, that helped with the transition is I created um, an entity, you know, because I created this company called the parent company. And then I created an LLC where I brought members into the LLC and I gave them first right of refusal on all my investments. Mm -hmm. And it was like a $10,000 buy-in. So that gave me a little bit of funding to kind of open the door. And then on my first deal, I just started raising money right, right away. Each tranche was like 400,000. And I started paying myself a real estate development fee. And that's how I kind of got started in the transition. Um, until I ended up owning some real estate that, you know, started paying the bills, but yeah, it was, a, it was a fee transition really. You know what I was doing in 92, 96, 99. 
Were you in high school or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. I was in junior high. Well, I was going, I was transitioning into junior high school. I went to uh, 51s up on uh, Fifth Avenue um, wow. back in uh, 92. No, was that 94? I went there. And then 96, I was in high school. So 99 is when I graduated, man. So while you wow. were doing big commercial deals, man, I was still trying to figure out life. And uh, yeah, it's cool. It. Yeah, got man. It. So I graduated in 79, 79. So I got 20 years on you. So you were, you were going to high school. You lived in Brooklyn at the time. And where was the high school at? It was in Bay Ridge. I went to telecommunications in Bay Ridge, right on, uh, what is that? 68th street. Yeah. Yeah. I know Brooklyn has Brooklyn tech over there. They got that real small high school. I was like, high school is different in New York. You got to apply to like go to high school and stuff. It's crazy. Yeah, man. So obviously, um, transitioning from, your from your job into uh now being responsible for the investing side of things and taking on your own projects takes a mindset shift Uh, how did that affect you like what was the mindset shift for you yeah you know it didn't happen right away um you know it started off nice because i literally signed you know this 10 million dollar development and and then signed a development agreement with myself Mm-hmm. And started writing a check for twenty seven thousand dollars a month. It wasn't until the towers collapsed in two thousand when, like, a, a, you know, one of the bottoms fell out for me, and I was mm-hmm. sitting there. I think I went, got down to like my last ten grand or something, and then I, I landed this um, construction project to renovate a, a geriatrics facility. Um, and by that time, you know, the the assisted living wasn't generating cash, so you know. I mean, it was it, at that point when I wasn't paying myself, you know, I was like, wow, you know, what happens during the periods when you don't have a development project paying you? Right. So that's when I actually leaned back and started doing a little bit of, of contracting work for third parties just to kind of pay the bills. I actually renovated the country club I belonged to. And then I did a geriatrics facility and then got at my next development. So I found that, you know, during this entitlement process, I either have to pack the pipeline so that developments fill those voids or do a little bit of contracting. So it was always, you know, um, a little bit of utilizing my expertise in that transition, you know, and I, I, I can't say that I ever used my engineering, you know, I had the license, but, you know, I never practiced engineering. So, you know, it was really just hustling until I, I then got into doing, you know, some wholesaling with the residential where I had the cash flow coming in. In you New know, York. Well, that was actually in Jersey thereafter, in Jersey. but in 2008, um, when I was doing a transition, I did, if you're familiar with, you probably are, uh, Keene University. Mm-hmm. Um, Union Station is one of the train lines that goes into Manhattan, into Penn Station. And I did 58 condo units right on there, and we called it a transit village. So in 2008, which was, you know, seven or eight years later, it took me, you know, finally to figure it out, you know, like, um, you know, doing fix and flips, building houses, doing developments, blending it all together. A little GC work was going to keep, you know, the 40 hours or, you know, live or 60 hours and you can keep the lights on, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. when you get started, you know, you playing the big game, you know, the bills are just as much as the money coming in, you know? Oh, absolutely, man. So obviously, you know, you got a ton of experience. You've been uh, through the ringer in this, in this business, you know, you, you spoke about nine 11 and nine 11, I was still on wall street. And then that's actually nine 11 is what actually, uh, transitioned me into real estate because mm-hmm. wall street wasn't, uh, the company I was working for, I had to shut down after everybody started pulling their money out. But, um, you, you've been able to do some incredible things in this business. What obstacles did you face, um, over the years? Oh Yeah. Sure. Yeah. When, um, yeah, I mean, literally when the towers collapsed, you know, I almost went out of business. Um, you know, I, I thank my success with being literally with Tony Robbins the day that the towers collapsed, I couldn't get out of Hawaii. I was stuck with him for like seven days. And, you know, when I came back, you know, my friend worked for Cantor Fitzgerald, he died. Um, in the towers. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I knew he was, you know, he was at his desk every day at seven. So when I saw that, I was in Hawaii when I watched the towers going down. I was like, okay, let me call. 
But um, yeah, that was my first blow. And, um, it, you know, I, I was like delirious because it was like the first time that happened to me. And then it happened again in 2008. I was partners. I was at the top of the world. I finished 240 Park Avenue. Um, we bought uh, the we bought the toy building, that triangular building mm -hmm. on Broadway. Mm -hmm. We bought St. Vincent's Hospital. We we're going to do a thousand uh, residential units. And we owned a whole city block on Sixth Avenue. And Lehman Brothers was our partner. And in wow. one day, we literally lost three hundred and thirty million dollars. Yep. And I was trying to figure out what building I was going to jump <laughs> off of because like real estate and everything I ever learned, um, you know, went south. Mm -hmm. um, the whole partnership blew up. Um, I literally, <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard the story, you know, started doing magic. And uh, I was a magician since I was 12 years old. You probably see me playing with cards here, but I yeah. studied with Joel Bauer. And he said, he goes, what'd you do? What have you done? I said, well, I built an eight figure deal with no money down. And that's what transitioned me into, you know, meeting, you know, I call them the Matt Andrews guys of the world, the gurus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's when I got in a room and I created eight figure deals with no money down, which was how I built my $17 million project to try to get my head out of my rear because, you know, I had basically said, okay, real estate's going to be done for a while. 505 projects stopped in New York City. There were cranes just stopped all over the air. And um, I literally contracted to buy Stewart Troop Air. Um, I was going to bring the beverage to China. I had another like car simonizing company. I wanted nothing to do with real estate. Mm -hmm. And uh, through, through doing some magic, doing trade shows and then creating that program, Joel's like, get in a room and record what you did. And I got in a room and I created eight figure deals with no money down. I created this 800 page manual and uh, all these videos of me recording. And that was my first program I created. So this was in 08. That was in 08. Yeah. 08, man. So that's how you did that magic trick when we was in uh that's how you did that car trick when we was in uh <laughs> and I was trying to figure it out in Tampa. <laughs> yeah, I think I was doing cards and coins or something, but yeah, yeah I, just, I think it was a coin. Yeah, yeah. Magic's you know, it's like you know, it's like when you're an artist, you're always painting or playing with a trick or something. Yeah. But yeah, magic's always been in my life. And then it took probably a good um three years before I decided to come back. And my first project coming out of, of that like bombardment was a brownstone in Brooklyn that uh, I made a couple hundred grand on. Was that Fort uh, Green or? It was, you know, and I can't think of the darn address right now, but it wasn't, um, it was, it was. Um, Brooklyn Heights, maybe. It was over in Brooklyn Heights. Yeah, gotcha. right off of Brooklyn Heights. Yeah. yeah, it was walking distance from, from Metro Tech. But gotcha. yeah, I mean that, you know, I made a couple hundred grand off that. And, and then, you know, it got interesting because I caught the attention <clears throat> just from some old players that were in the industry. And I went into a partnership with a guy who had a non-union construction company. And in, I guess it was 2012, 13, 14, 15, we did 300 units in New York City and we started a concrete company. I literally poured four or five 30-story towers in concrete. <laughs> hanging out with all the gangsters. <laughs> and I was like, I, I don't want to do this anymore, but yeah. made a lot of money. And in 2016 is when I created Flippin' USA, Flippin' New Jersey. And that's when we started scraping auction sites and, and did the 137 deals in 2017. And then 18, I started thinking about the book. The book came out in 19. And then at the end of 19, we started buying property. So yeah. that's been my journey, you know? That's a great journey, man. So obviously you have a step-by-step -step process. Like me, you went from rags to riches and back to rags and then back to riches, right? Yeah. So yeah. why don't we provide our listeners with a step-by-step -step process, man? How, how should our listeners set up their business the right way for success? Yes. Yes. Um, perfect question. So first thing is, you know, don't hesitate in, in, setting it up right because a lot of times we're still thinking about it and you just have to throw the hat over the fence based on one simple fact you get to write off immediate expenses and become a business owner and take advantage of all the luxuries of being an entrepreneur so a lot of people that hesitate um you know maybe hesitate because of knowledge so if you you know if you got to get out there and get some knowledge educate yourself in the different entity structures 
you know, I'd recommend, um, you know, not just keep it simple at first, because I, I like to complicate things. You know, when I started, I created a C Corp that was paying an S Corp that was paying two LLCs that were paying my children. And that was the way that I kind of did my taxation filtration. You know, I always tell people, you know, if you're not familiar, there are some companies out there that'll assist you with opening up an entity, but you can, you know, essentially go to any state that you're at. I typically open up entities in either Delaware or, um, you know, Nevada, you know, because there's some tax advantages, but get yourself set up with a limited liability company and do some research and begin to look at all the you know, expenses you can write off because if you're, you know, you're immediately in business, you know, you got your telephone expense, you got your auto, you could write off, you know, nowadays with all this COVID stuff, a portion of your home office and really take advantage and set yourself up. Um, you know, as my accountant taught me with all the tax advantages that you get as an entrepreneur, you know, and, and that's, you know, I would think step one, you know, getting the structure set up. Um, this, you know, step two, um, you know, which is kind of coincide with step one, you obviously want to put your, your plan together, you know, mm-hmm. what your business plan is. Now, I always, I, I may be a little bit different because I was a C student in college. If I was an A student, I, I may be telling you to write the, the full report, but, you know, I, you know, I, I, I like to help people and give them a template and go, you know, here's, here's a report that I wrote, just redline it based on what's coming through your head. Like, what do you, you know, when did you start your company? What, what is your company to provide? And from that red line, extract it and create what I call is a company one sheet. You know, and I have, I have a lot on one sheet of paper, but it's a little bit different in your presentation other than just giving somebody a business card. And it gives you a little bit more gravitational pull. So I like to kind of think through your planning, your business, and then take, you know, that, business plan that no one's going to probably read and put it on a real powerful one sheet and, and, and really lay out that plan. And, and, and then, you know, I mean, if you're, you know, there's a lot of different steps, but, you know, step three, you know, which I think is, is probably just as important as step one and two is, you know, you have to have systems in place, right? I, I don't know if I, I mentioned it, but, you know, when I looked at what I did in, in, in skyscrapers, what had like, you know, 500 moving parts and, I'm like, okay, I could build this thing, but what's real estate about? Real estate's really finding, funding, and facilitating the process, right? If you were just to simplify it, one, two, three. And, you know, these are the systems that you have to put in place. Because if you don't have systems, you know, you're essentially, you know, putting yourself in a category, I would say 90% of people without systems have a good probability of failing. Yep. So, you know, you want to have systems in to find property, right? And there's tons of systems out there. And then look at the micro distinctions on how people are finding property and try to differentiate yourself. And that's where I also get into, um, you know, talk about, you know, real estate's all location, location, location. You know, when I came from New York, I was all about presentation, presentation, presentation. So Mm. mine had a little flair to it, but the residential investors that looked at my presentation were like, you know, who is this guy? He ain't like that (laughs) normal residential investor, you know? a residential guy, you know, and I was able to have a little bit more of a gravitational pull, Mm -hmm. you know, so, so, you know, systems and and put your systems around finding it and have backup systems and don't be afraid to try things the old fashioned way and always be looking to improve your systems because right when you think you have all the systems that are working for you, there's always something a little bit better, you know, and then on, you know, funding, you know, once again, the presentation applies a lot also, but there's, there's a little bit of a system to funding and, you know, you could get stuck in trying to raise money, you know, all the time because it, it's a job in itself. So, so the whole funding aspect, you know, and the good news is when you're involved in the residential or the wholesaling, you know, you have the luxury of private lending and you have hard money lenders and it makes it a lot easier versus when you take a step up in the commercial where you're getting out there and dealing with your high net individuals and things like that. And you have to step up your presentation and, spend a little bit more on marketing. But when you're thinking that way and using that thought process, you know, just, you know, doing your day-to-day thing in the residential, you you just have a micro distinction and you're a step above everybody else. So, you know, a little bit on that. And then facilitation, you know, of the investments, you know, if you're, if you're doing wholesaling, you know, you want your assignment process to be down to a science, you know, have your template, have, have your scripting, you know, if, if there's, if there's a process, you know, and you're, I used to call my property analyzers, you know, 
um, where they would be calling the foreclosures attorney, checking to see if it's in the flood zone, um, checking to see if there's any utility zone, see if, if there's a condo association. You know, my guys were in the field with the bank keys, going into the houses, taking pictures. Everybody was feeding into a Facebook system. Bids were sent, being sent out to the guy, right? Those were our systems on the day of the auction so that we can get three or four deals, you know? And without those systems and, you know, field reconnaissance and, you know, property analyzers, you know, it just doesn't happen. But all that right. didn't happen overnight, right? We, we put scraping software in place to help us find the data. Mm -hmm. We had a system in place to analyze the deal. We had certain phone calls that had to be made. We had certain pictures that the field guys had to take. And that was all based on the foundation that we started building that I was mentioning before, right? Structure of the entity, taxation advantages, you know, understanding your plan, what your mission is, having systems in place, and then full speed execution, you know? That's it, man. So you, you want to get set up the right way. Once you get set up, have that game plan, then put some systems in place, then you get the funding, then you facilitate, then you execute. That's pretty much what, what I got out of it, right? Yeah, I mean, we can complicate it and make it longer, but you know, I, I would like to keep it simple. Oh, that's, like that. that's simple, man. That's <laughs> yeah, good stuff, it, man. Yeah, it's, so, it's not that complicated. You know, I, I've made it complicated and, you know, for, for you know, guys that are out there that, you know, that, you know, that are in taxation and finance and engineering, this is pretty easy compared to all mm -hmm. that stuff, you know? So um, when, when, when you look at your businesses, you, you've done a little bit of residential, you've done some commercial, you've done, you know, pretty much everything, right? Do you use the same strategy for, for each? Do you use the same strategy for each, um, for each business model, if that makes sense? Type of real estate type of thing. Each type of real estate transaction. Yeah. yeah, good question. You know, it's funny because um, e I've even found myself doing fix and flips using the same type of analogy on how I would reverse engineer the structure of a larger development. Mm -hmm. Where you know I'll look at it, you know, you know, from a I call it a paper napkin standpoint. Like, okay, the, the total, I, I, you know, it's it's total cost or total, you know. Um, expenditure. I call it total development costs. I just think that way, you know, and if you're in on a property for 200 and, you know, and you, you think you're going to be in for 200, you know, I just rule of thumb, you know, <clears throat> I'll be conservative and say, you need about 30% equity. So then I know my calculations are coming out, figure out what my cash flow is, do a quick cash on cash analysis, throw it into, you know, an IRR if I was going to hold it for 10 years and when they see you do that little kind of analysis on a residential, they're like, yeah, I'll give you some money, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? And, um, you know, so I, I do find myself and, you know, but then I always get back to this theory about try to get it all on one sheet. So if I'm analyzing a residential deal, I'll have the full analysis on one sheet from a stabilization standpoint, you know, which, which I show you how to do it. And another sheet, I'll just show you a 10 year cash flow. Mm -hmm. because that's really what your investors want to look at. You know, like what's the duration of the investment? What are they going to make? And, you know, what's, what's the long term on it? Because a lot of times you get, you know, your depreciation, you get your reduction of principal benefits and all those little items add up to your rate of return. How hard is it to get uh, into, well, how hard is it to transition from residential to you know, commercial and building skyscrapers and stuff like that. You know, now that I did it in reverse, you know, I, I would have to say it, you know, you've heard, you may have heard me say it. Like if you're going to build a skyscraper, just you're building 30 houses on top of each other because mm. you're literally doing the same thing over and over. When, when I tell you, you know, the green fence goes up, you've seen hundreds of them in Brooklyn and New York, you don't see anything for six months. And then all of a sudden, you know, when I was in the concrete business, we would pour a floor every four days. It was called the four day cycle. So literally like after 30 days, you know, or after 60 days, the tower's up and it's game on. And then at that point, you're just repeating the process. You know, the curtain wall, he's doing a floor at a time and right behind him, you know, you're standing studs and running your, your ductwork risers. And then you're just cycling electrician, plumber, sheetrock, tape and spackle, tile, you know, flooring, and you're just going up the building, you know, and um, that's really it. You know, you're just repeating the process and adding a couple zeros on the on the funding side. That's all it is, man. 
So a lot of people, a lot of us mentally will overcomplicate that, but it's really simple when you look at it from, you know, a grand scheme of things, when you look at it from a bird's eye view, right? Yeah, it's simple in the sense that, you know, okay, we've all grabbed an 800 pound gorilla. Let's just say this one's 1200 pounds or about the size of your bicep, you know, so it takes you a, hand, you know, a minute to get your arm around it. But, you know, you, you just keep hugging that gorilla and then you get your arms around it, you know, yeah. or you, you take him one bite at a time. You know, we don't build skyscrapers like that. Like when you go back to Brooklyn and you look at Brooklyn Union Gas headquarters, you know, we spent, you know, like 12 months building that on paper. You know, that foundation was, you know, I think it was 500 feet long. You know, it was amazing, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I'll never forget it, you know. And, and yeah. when I stood on top of that building, looking out at the trade center, I'm like, I'm ready. <laughs> Let's do this. Amen. <laughs> hey, man. Good stuff. Great, great stuff, man. I, I really appreciate you sharing all of this information, man. If our listeners wanted to get in contact with you, where should they go, Ken? Yeah, you know, and, and let's um, figure out what we can do for your listeners there and, and get started. Maybe we do some type of master class. But we have um, the 11 millionairesecrets.com, which is just a gift on some of the secrets I learned. And you can go to kendanlu.com and there are uh, free 45 minute strategy sessions, which I actually do myself because I don't um, drive traffic. I just, you know, I do some podcasts and people come on. I get a couple calls a week. So I actually do pick up the phone. But yeah, I'd love to uh, pick people up. And we also have our uh, global real estate investment enterprise, which I didn't even have a chance to tell you. It's just an ecosystem that I created that I'd love to have you part of. And we'll talk about that in another uh, another show. You know, Absolutely, man. And I, I know you have a YouTube page as well. I'm going to be linking that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link all of this stuff in the description box uh, for you guys to, uh, to be able to participate with Ken. Uh, he's doing some big things. Obviously, if you if you're listening to this podcast, you can hear it. You know, the guy knows what he, he knows his stuff, knows what he's talking about. And uh, he's actually out here in the trenches doing deals. That's what it's all about. He's making money right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and when you call me, just tell me, you know, Jamel sent you and, uh, you know, we're giving all kinds of discounts. I'm not here to make money, man. If you come here and you tell me what you want to achieve, my goal is to make you achieve that. You know, that's it. That's it, man. So, look, it, it's been a, you know, look. There's a lot of information that we covered today. A lot of you guys are brand new. Um, the goal today was to help you get set up, right? Ken gave you a six-step process on how to do that the right way. And a lot of it is just basically getting set up and understanding what goes on after that. If you notice, he talked about systems a lot, right? If your systems aren't in place, then you're going to be out of place, right? So you need to have systems in place in your business. So consider getting set up the right way. Talk to some tax professionals, some attorneys, right? But also talk to Ken because he's done this and he knows exactly what you need to do to go from where you are to where you want to go. So yes. Ken, we really appreciate you, man. If you had to provide some last words for our listeners, what would those words be? Yeah. You know, time is our most valuable commodity. Um, I've really taken heart to time blocking this year and, and, writing down, you know, what I believe are, you know, the things that are most important, which is, you know, your business, your relationships and your health. And from those three things, you know, you can come up with three great things to make every day phenomenal. And what I found to be totally successful is measuring, right? So measure at the end of every day on how your day went as planned versus as built. That's a little building technology a term we use as planned versus as built. And one thing I found very successful is that people have a tendency to think that they're a failure when in reality, they're failing a measurement. And one of the games that I've been playing over the years is I measure my personal and business growth on a daily basis on a one to 10. Mm -hmm. And I, I play around with it. because I say, Hey, Jamal, my, uh, my, my, my personal today was only a seven. Cause you know, I didn't get my, my workout in and I left my iPads home and it was raining or something. It could, you know, it just, it wasn't a perfect day. And my business was a nine because, you know, I had two great sales calls and the meeting went great and it's called quality quantifying. And, you know, I just find between, um, you know, the quality quantifying and, and, and time blocking, you really, you really could appreciate life, you know, cause you don't let the world of distractions around you. I found that, uh, my success came from deep work. And I realized that with all the internet and all of the social media, that life is one huge distraction. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, you got a time block to get into your deep work to get your most production. People that do deep work have like results, like you hear Grant Cardone talk about 10x. People that are in deep work have have resulted in like 40x. You know, like people like scientists producing, you know, Nobel Peace Prize and you know, people writing 20 books. These are people that are in that deep work zone. And you know, that's the wisdom I leave leave with everybody. And in addition to your morning routine, try an evening routine just of gratitude, and uh, it's all going to pay it forward. Love it, love it, ladies and gentlemen. My man Ken Van Lu, he is a real estate expert. Definitely check out all of the links in the description box that I'm going to provide for you right below this video. And also reach out to Ken. He wants to hear from you. He wants to do business with you. And we're planning on having him back for several other segments because I'm, I'm telling you, the guy is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to different aspects of real estate and business in general. So uh, what else do you guys want to hear from Ken? Do me a favor, leave a comment in the comment section. If you're on YouTube, go ahead yeah. and like this video, subscribe to this channel, click the notification bell and share this podcast with anyone who's looking to get started in real estate. And uh, make sure you check out Ken's uh, YouTube page. He has a lot of good information on it, a lot of great information on there. And uh, I think it'll help you guys out as well. Really appreciate you guys joining us, listening in today. We'll see you guys on the next one. Take care.